turn off on it. Awesome, thank you. Um, cool that you guys all spent the lunch break with me. Um, I hope I can give some random advice. I feel um, as founder, it's always quite hard to uh, listen to advice and then execute on it. So just see it as like our story, kind of, as another data point on how you build your own companies. And um, what actually brings me to my first question, who of you here has their own company or is starting to build their own company? Just raise your hands, okay. Um, cool. And what do these other people do? Um, are you engineers or working in startups or? Yeah. Um, how many engineers are here? Okay, awesome. We are hiring, by the way. <laughs> um, but I could talk about that later. Um, cool stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, um, my name is Alex. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Raza. Um, today is a little bit about um, pretty much how we came to what we do right now. Um, because our journey, and when I say our, I mean uh, my co-founder and my journey pretty much, uh, started three years ago back in the days in London. And uh, through like different steps, we ended up being in Berlin. Uh, we ended up working on what we do right now with Raza, which is more um, conversational AI um, with an open source angle. Um, we can also talk about that later, why we do this. But I think it's more interesting actually uh, to tell the story of how we shut down our first product, and um, that's sort of what this is all about. And um, that's also what the magical despite moments are all about, and I'm gonna talk, talk later about what that actually means. Um, and I think uh, what would sort of be interesting for me, I think is also just if you just interrupt me if you have any questions uh, throughout these slides. So I really don't wanna make it like a boring presentation because it's lunchtime and everyone is probably really tired. Um, so please uh, just ask if you have any questions right away. Um, and then hope to give you at least like some uh, interesting things for you guys to think about. Where it all started for us uh, was like, it was two years ago, a bit more than two years ago. Um, there was like three months before Techstars. Um, my co-founder and I were like, woo, -hoo -hoo, you know, living the dream. Uh, we just launched this product uh, on Product Hunt and like, you know, people got excited about it, upvoted it, downloaded it and stuff like that. And we were like, woo, awesome. Uh, same time, also like Texas made us an offer to join the accelerator program here in Berlin. Um, there was the first cohort here in, in Berlin, um, so it just like started. We were like all super excited. Um, we were two people by then. Then you know we got this offer from Texas, which has like a little convertible note of 120k. So we thought we have money. You know we're gonna invest that in team and hire some people. Uh, so we ended up being like five people when we joined Texas. And then a few months later, uh, that was like pretty much Alan and my. Uh, face, uh, you know, disappointment, um, we burned through all the money, uh, we, you know, <laughs> didn't really have anything, um, and as I said, like this sort of 30 minutes or however long this will be today, um, is really about like how we got there and sort of what we learned from this, because I mean, right now we are not crying anymore, uh, it's going all well, um, we have a company of 18 people, we're profitable, and uh, everything is, is going good. Uh, so we at least learned something out of that. And for us, looking back to this time um, with Treve, that was the product, and I'm going to explain you in a second what it did, um, is always some like a good measurement and also I think it just a very good reference point of like you know how it feels if it doesn't work. And by no means it works everything right now, but it's just at least a little better, right? And it just like gives you some reference points throughout like making decisions in the company and making sure that you're on the right path. So Treef, uh, yeah, that was the genius idea back in the days we thought. Uh, it was pretty much like a combination out of a search engine and an easier way to share files across different things like Dropbox and Google Drive. And um, if you guys work in startups and like, you know, smaller companies, you're probably aware of the problem that uh, there are so many different tools people use at work and it's just a very big clutter. And um, this is not only true for startups, it's actually very true for large enterprises as well, um, especially the ones that just acquire other large companies all the time. So it's like a total mess in terms of like knowledge management and all of that. And I think it's still an unsolved problem. Um, just the way how we tackled the problem didn't make any sense in the end. That's what we found. Um, so we, we had like many different product iterations, but this is one of it. Uh, was a mobile app um, and I think we just built a mobile app because you know two years ago mobile apps were cool and <laughs> we didn't really start from the process of like this is really what our users want right I mean we we started with like oh it's like hard to share um, files on mobile devices but never really thought through like what is the actual process that would make it easier for people to do that and um, so we just like built this mobile app that in the end nobody wanted but we spent a lot of like time on 
making it look nice and you know cool and fancy and shiny. Um, iterated a lot on the landing page to make it better, but in the end nobody wanted it. And I think that's sort of the the biggest lesson for us. So the question is like, how did we get from woo to like? this downside kind of thing and being disappointed. And fast, that process is, I mean, and you know these terms, um, everyone talks about customer development, what does it really mean? I think the only thing that it should really mean is finding product market fit because otherwise there's no point in talking to customers, right? And product market fit is always related like to finding a big problem, but uh, what our journey was, was a bit like that, right? So pretty much, before we entered Techstars, so that was here, um, we had all these thoughts. We, you know, we thought like Tree is for everyone. It'll solve everyone's problem. It'll help a product manager within a company to find their documents. It will help the CEO to find the fundraising deck and all of that. Um, and it was really not the right approach we found. Um, and what we did and what led to this like disappointment, I think, back in the days, was actually a very structured approach to figure out for whom we are building this. So we throughout Techstars took a step back and pretty much defined like different groups of people that could use something that we've built like also based on who downloaded it and who was actually using it at least a little bit and then try to narrow it down to actually one group of customers and then talk to this one group of customers and then figured out that for them it doesn't really solve a big enough problem so the the process of like starting with a lot of people then looking on like who is using it the most, uh, which in this case actually was product managers. And we talked to product managers, like 50 of them or something, and asked them, what is your biggest problem? And they never said, it's anything related to Treve. And it was like a really sad moment because I had all these calls, but um, made us realize that we're just building the wrong thing, right? I mean, we, we built it, and I think it's a classical thing um, that we see a lot when we talk to other founders, starting out with like your own little pet idea and obviously, and it's also good. I mean, you know, it's good to be have conviction for your idea and be convinced that you have some genius insight that nobody has. But I think being able to then admit that you're not always so genius, and you know, also geniuses might have bad ideas, um, was an important process for us. And that's pretty much um, where it led to. So how did we get there? Um, pretty much like testing our hypotheses, and that also that is very obvious. I have some more, I, I hope, less obvious things um, in this presentation, but pretty much user interviews, that's the first one. Obviously, you need to talk to your users. Um, Mockups helps a lot, fake products help a lot. I can also talk about that in a second, what we did uh, with, with a bot that we've built, but also like onboarding users in person. That was something that we found to be super, super important. Um, because we were always like wondering, okay, you know, they all download it, but then nothing happens. Uh, what is it? And we, if we, for example, built like this, I think, really futuristic and cool product, uh, which was a keyboard extension <laughs> where you can share Dropbox files with. Uh, sounds really cool. We found, uh, I mean, if you think it through, it actually makes a lot of sense. But you cannot explain people how they install a keyboard extension on their iPhone. It's like impossible. And there have been a bunch of startups. Um, I think recently one shut down and um, that always try to like enhance and make a better keyboard and it's really, really, really hard because people just don't get the process of installing it and I think Apple made it simpler but that was one of the things that we just found, right? I mean, and if we got people to use it, they were like, wow, it's amazing, you know, I use it all day but, you know, if it doesn't, doesn't work, then it doesn't. Um, you have the analytics part um, which I think a lot of people also just always handle very dishonest in many ways um, so, you know, there are daily active users and there are sometimes daily active users. And I think a lot of people also in a rush of like raising money and, you know, justifying that they build a product that people want are dishonest about these metrics. And there are really just, you know, daily active users that are active every day. And <laughs> there's a reason why if you have a lot of daily active users, your company is worth a lot, um, like Facebook. So achieving that is important, but it also doesn't mean that your product is shit, right? Because sometimes you might have a product that you only use every now and then, and then it's more important that people pay for it or something like that. Um, so these are like all, I guess, like things that you could do. Um, what's more important for us is, what, uh, what we did back in the days is pretty much we tried to cluster that a little bit. So I said that we had these 20 groups of people that use our product. Um, so we called that cohorts, so like different cohorts of people. And then we said, okay, what use cases do they use Tree for um, back in the days? And uh, then we had like, so 
this here is like daily, right? So the size of the circle uh, means like the frequency, how often they use it. Um, and then this is pretty much like what Treve is right now is like the blue one here that you can see here um, that they already use it for and then the vision of the product. And obviously vision is very fluffy and you know, you can always make up stuff that your product will do in the future. Um, so you know, I, I probably would not do that again now. That's like from two years ago, this screenshot. Um, but what that helped us to understand is really that for product people, we had like sort of the most frequency in usage, which was important for us back in the days. Um, but we also understood that like this angle here of like, you know, sort of forwarding and forwarding like files within an organization, but also organizing it was really important um, to them. But then again, like we talked to 50 product people and nobody really had that as a major problem in their lives. Um, so we sort of stopped working on this. But I think uh, overall this thinking of like cohorts and like use cases is very important, especially if you already have a product and you sort of, because I mean, let's face it, right? It's reality that people just build products all the time. Um, for the better or the worse. Um, but if you have one, you can at least test it with people and then you might find that nobody wants it and then you need to take a decision that it's shit, but it could have also worked out, right? I mean, I could stand here with a Treef jacket now, uh, but I'm not. <laughs> so the question is like, what did we learn from this? Um, and I know that like lessons learned are always a bit boring uh, for people if you haven't made it through the process. I think the biggest lesson learned overall is that it's totally fine to build a product that nobody wants and just totally fail with it and burn VC cash. Uh, if you if you can get VC cash, do it, burn it, and you know learn. Why? I mean, why not? Um, so I think that's the first lesson. It's not on there, but you should totally do that. Um, and if you can get into Techstars with a product that you think nobody wants, also do it. Why not? So you know you're young and you know, you learn from it. I think that's really important. But more a bit of a hands-on approach in terms of like lessons learned for us was really to have a structure in that because the picture that I showed earlier with like before Texas, we were literally just like running around like headless chickens and didn't really know who we are building it for. And I remember like I, I think three years ago I saw this like I think it was like a template for a pitch. So how you can pitch your idea to somebody. And one important component of that was always who are you building it for, right? <laughs> so what's your customer? And I don't know, Alan and so Alan is my co-founder and I were always a bit uh, probably too, too arrogant about it as in we just build it for everyone, right? Because I mean, these are all the companies that you see out there, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all these guys, they usually build products for everyone, um, but they never started like that. So I think taking this into consideration is, is something really important. Who is your initial customer and then making sure uh, that you can scale that to other people, obviously, because otherwise it's not that interesting. But having a structured process about about like finding out if people like what you do or if, they, if it solves a problem is really important. Um, so obviously I'm German, so I say you should have structured process, but <laughs> I think it really helps. Um, so that's the first one. I think it's clicker. Yeah, the next one, also the obvious one, everyone will tell you that uh, every good presentation about startups has it in there, but it's really true. Start with a problem and not a solution. And I think it's like the hardest thing of all to do because most people are always thinking about solutions all the time and um, how they can fix things, how they can make stuff simpler and don't really take a step back and think of the problem. Because in our case, back in the days, um, I guess the major problem that we really tried to solve was more around knowledge management in companies. And I think if we would have started like that, we would have very, very quickly figured out that small companies don't have that problem as big as large companies, right? We probably would have ended up being an enterprise search company, which is also like probably not the company that we want to build. But in the end, you know, it's a different problem space and um, also totally different amounts of willingness of payment and stuff like that. Um, so really starting with the problem is super important and ideally you have this problem yourself and um, that's how we landed on on Raza. I can talk later about this more but um, having the problem yourself is something really important and then again having a structured process of like looking back on does everyone else has a problem as well or is it just me or am I special or stupid or I don't know that's all these questions are really important to ask. 
So next question that I think most people try to avoid, um, why now? So <laughs> this is a question we always avoided with Treef because I remember like I, three years ago I was uh, in Silicon Valley the first time. There was a company um, that went through Y Combinator and they did exactly what we did, but like three years earlier than us. <laughs> they found that it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> then they got acquired by Apple, which is a bit of a better outcome for them than us. Um, but then anyways, I, I met this founder and he said, Alex, you need to have a really, really good reason why you with Treef can do it better than like all the other 20 companies that didn't work out before, right? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, we have this cool feature coming up and here's this other one and, you know, all this bullshit. And it's really, the why now question is not about features. I think the only thing that is reasonable there to say, which is somehow related to features, is that there has been like a technology breakthrough where you and your co-founders spent like five years in your PhD on it to you know, make sure that you can solve this. I think that's the only fair thing to say there on the feature end. All the other things are usually market related or I don't know, like all of a sudden um, all the companies start using five different cloud storages at the same time, which they always try to avoid, right? So that's <laughs> more a counter argument for us back in the days. Um, so really having a good question on that. And that's I think also what most people say is like the magical insight of a company. I'm not sure if you ever heard this phrase, but a lot of people would ask you like, you know, what's your insight that nobody else has into the market? And that's usually related to that, so why now? And for everything that everyone thought about, there was always something, somebody else had thought about it before, for sure. Um, you might just don't know them or you might not find them in research because they talk differently about it. Um, but that's at least usually my experience from that always somebody else has thought about it and there are really good reasons and usually it's not that you are smarter than them. Sometimes it is, but I think not really often uh, that you can execute better on this. So have a good answer for this question, even if it means that you're building shit and nobody wants it. That's also a good answer and then you know you can look for new problems. Um, <laughs> another thing, um, and we still see this nowadays um, with our product that small samples are usually really enough, right? Um, so most people come like from an academic setting where you would do a survey with 100 or 200 people and then you want to talk to 200 product managers to figure out if they really want this, right? Um, my experience, I talked to these 50 product managers and you know, if I would have known that before, I would have talked to two because <laughs> none of the first two said that it's a big problem for them and so did not the other ones, right? So. Um, and, and part of that is, again, like having conviction for your idea and sometimes it's important. Maybe you're going to find this one product manager that is like, again, like the question right now, right? M he might just be the more advanced guy and he's like writing this new wave of, I don't know, organizing his files or something like that. And then maybe all the, the rest of the market will switch to that as well in five years and then it's genius what you do. But usually it's not like that. And uh, usually you get a very quick indication if people want this, right? And uh, just one example of the way how we did this for, for, our, for our new thing with Raza. Um, so we are selling pretty much to developers. We have like tools that help you build pretty much bots and assistants um, that are very smart and you can sort of automatically talk to them. And the way how we started this is with no product at all. Um, we actually validated the industries first that would want something like this by just selling really expensive workshops. And what we found there is that, for example, insurance companies and banks bought these workshops really, really quickly. And that at least validated the problem that they have a very big problem in like customer service with costs and stuff like that where our technology would come in and help them a lot. Um, but it also showed us that other industries like e-commerce didn't buy any workshops. And it's because they don't have this problem as big. I mean, obviously they have customer service, um, but they interact much more often with their customers. So having something like conversational AI is not so important to them. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh, the channels were mostly like personal contacts initially, right? So we started off, I mean, we had a very similar, this matrix that I just showed, we had a very similar one, but for industries. So not like people or like not product managers, but industries. And then we started off like selling them people that we knew, you know, we contacted people at insurance companies and stuff like that. And then we went to conferences and spoke about the topic. That's pretty much what we did, yeah. And I think we talked to like 200 big companies or something in um, five months or, yeah. And it was a, like when we looked back at the data or like who buy, bought it, it was like super clear that 
insurance companies and banks and telcos are the ones to go after. Yeah. But that, again, like small sample size, right? Because there are not that many telcos in the world. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's, I think most people just don't know how it feels if you have something that people really want. Um, which brings me to my last point. And uh, so I, I call that, because I don't have a better word for that, uh, the magical despite moments. And what I mean with that is pretty much, you know, you always try to make up excuses why nobody wants your product. And I think this is totally the wrong thinking. Uh, you should look for the moments where people really want your product. And I think that's an overall misconception. And I, I think I touched on that earlier uh, with like Treve. You know, we always, I think every week we try to iterate on our landing page. Um, <laughs> I remember having like millions of sessions on a whiteboard with Alan to think about like how can we best explain what we do in order that people download it and use it, right? And the truth to that was just nobody wanted it, even if you describe it as something else or like <laughs> something better. You know, you might find the best one-liner to explain what you do, but then if nobody wants it, they don't care. Um, so I think the best product overall, and that's something sort of what we learned early on um, in this process, that you really want something that people want despite everything being extremely shit. Um, and I have a bunch of examples for that because I think it's always quite hard for people to, to figure out what product market fit really means. And, you know, product market fit mi might mean something else uh, for your products. It's just like from our experience. And um, I think overall it's just a good model to think about it like that. Yeah, so classical example, everyone thinks that you always need to write follow-ups to your customers. And, um, you know, if you do enterprise sales and stuff like that, you want to make sure that you get back quickly to your customer when they write to you. you want to make sure that you follow up 10 minutes after the call so that they have the presentation. You're going to follow up three days later if they haven't responded yet to get the next meeting. Or like what a lot of good salespeople do, you would schedule the next call already in the previous call in the calendar so that they cannot run away, right? Um, this is all really good and it all makes a lot of sense if you have a product that people want. So if you want to optimize your sales funnel and if you want to optimize your sales operations, this is like totally good and you should always do that. The problem is, if you do that too early on, you never really know if people really want what you do. So I think the best way is really that customers follow up with you, they hunt you down, they find your phone number, they call you, and want to make sure that they can have a follow up. So that's one indicator, right? So that's just an example of a despite moment. Yeah, um, the next one, <laughs> I have a funny anecdote on that. Um, so the, the reason why Rasa exists as a company is pretty much because Alan and I, after Dreve, um just hacked together a bunch of bots on Slack. Um, so different things, like, you know, we built this fun bot, uh, <laughs> which was called Cartman, um, and it pretty much annoyed all your teammates if they haven't gone back to you on a message yet. So if you would mention somebody in Slack and they don't respond to it within two hours, Cartman would come and just say, you know, Alex, you should respond to Alan, you know. Just stupid shit, right, like that. So that's how we started, but then uh, we built this thing called Databot. And uh, Databot was pretty much a very simple way to ask questions around like, what's my revenue like? Or how much users did I have last week in my app? And it would connect to a database, in this case a SQL database, and then give you a response. So that was the idea. Sounded quite cool. We don't do this anymore <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, because we iterated on that, right? And we found that it sounds like a cool thing, but nobody wants it. Um, that has been the common theme in our company. <laughs> but anyways, what I wanted to say is that uh, the way how we tried this is that we, first of all, didn't really had a product initially. So it was like people sending us natural language questions and then Alan turning that into an SQL query and then giving back the response. So it was like totally manual. And um, that at least helped us to validate that people want something like this. And um, what we then did is we tried to just charge for it. We just came up with like random prices and price points. And some people, like small business owners, for example, that have like something like Square or like uh, these like, you know, cash points things. Um, because uh, they actually wanted to know like how much they made yesterday with cake and coffee and stuff like that. So that was interesting for them. So they paid us money and this one guy from 
Canada that we never met before. He ran like this, actually I was in Vancouver just recently. Um, <laughs> he ran like this coffee shop in Vancouver and uh, just you know thought it was such a cool product and he just gave us his credit card details in plain text and email. Um, so that was a really strong indicator for us that he really wants this, right? Because he never saw us before, he never talked to us before. He just found this product over, I think it must have been like beta list or something. Like that. So he just signed up and then we were like, surely we can connect your Square account. Um, <laughs> and then we called a friend because we didn't connect to the API. So we called a friend who had Square in the US and then he gave us his credentials. And anyways, so like lots of hacking, but we at least knew that he was willing to pay 50 euros a month, which is quite a lot for such a small business owner, uh, for the service of getting his like revenue every day in Slack, but also being able then to ask a few questions back. So that was cool. What we then found as the next step is that this segment just doesn't scale because the customer acquisition cost for getting restaurant owners is like, I don't know, 500 euros or something per person. And it doesn't really work, right? That's the reason why all these big companies, even Square, still struggle in, in getting many more of these people because they're super hard to reach and to sell to. Um, so this analytics product didn't really work out. But we found that uh, there's a lot of problems in building bots and that's sort of how uh, Rasa came together. But what I want to tell you here is like, you know, you don't need like a fancy shining payment page uh, in the style of Amazon. You know, you just need somebody that wants to buy your product and then they're going to pay you somehow anyways. And if it is like over you sending your personal PayPal account over and they wire it, that's cool. But it's really about just collecting money. I think the best thing that I've seen here is, and I never did that, but I, I would love to try it on some point. Uh, we just have our deals are way too big so that people cannot pay them with credit card. But if you have smaller deals, um, people just taking a little thing like Square, putting it on your phone and then going into a meeting with somebody doing customer development and say, you know, how much would you pay for that? And they say 100 euros a month. And then you say, okay, cool. Then, you know, we build it for you tomorrow and then you just charge it in the meeting. So if you can get something like that, I think that's usually a strong indicator of you are at least like tackling some problem that is relevant for people. So like payment is important early on. Um, yeah, then I think I talked about this. Um, people get in touch with you despite having a great landing page. Um, I always was like, I, I think it's like the probably <laughs> early founder arrogance, but I always like went to these enterprise websites of like enterprise product X, Y, Z, right? And it looked really shitty and it looked like from the 90s. And I was like, how can they actually even sell something, right? But in the end, it's really not about the website. Um, it's really about your product. So if you solve somebody else's problem and you are able to at least describe it in a way that they understand it vaguely, they will contact you anyways. And they don't need like shiny pictures and stuff like that. They don't need like the latest, greatest uh, design on your website. That again becomes really, really important. I'm not saying like UX and UI is not important. I'm just saying in the very early days, it doesn't matter that much to explain your product in that sense. It becomes super important obviously in the future if you scale up and again, like optimize your processes and everything. Uh, but you know, don't blame your website for not getting any signups for your product. Blame your product or yeah, blame yourself if you're not able to kill your product. Um, <laughs> and then the last point is really more about um, this excuse. And I heard that a lot uh, from people that we are too small of a company that nobody, no, none of the big guys wants to work with us, right? Um, Sometimes it's true, but usually it's an indicator that you're doing something which is much too commoditized already. Um, so, you know, if you have really, really cool tech that solves problems of people in large enterprises, they will work with you anyways um, because it solves their problem, right? And there's no other solution on the market. So I think having this excuse of like, I don't know, these guys are way too big to work with such an unreliable and small startup is not really true. It becomes, I think, more true if the market matures, if you know, more other people have similar solutions, maybe then it's an argument. But in the beginning, they, you know, despite you being a shitty little startup, working with you is also a very important indicator of these like despite moments, um, how I call them. So I, I hope that gives you like a little bit of a indication. The last point that I wanted to make is more about, a, it's a personal one. And I think, again, like it's despite, but it's really, you know, you're so excited about what you built and the problem that you're solving that despite having slept only three hours, you still get up at seven, 
and you still have like the best meeting with your customer at 7:30 and don't blame your like you know i'm i'm not saying you should only sleep 3 hours that's a different topic but you know you shouldn't blame your company's success on that because a lot of people have done it and i guess if you talk to people that built twitter facebook etc they probably also had some all nighters and needed to get up in the morning again but they were so excited to sell their product anyways that they made it through I really want to make sure again that you don't think you should only sleep three hours. <laughs> I think I sleep quite a lot, um, but sometimes it's just you know you. I mean, I think I sleep like seven or eight hours a night, so that's good. Uh, but sometimes you cannot avoid it, and then it comes to these situations, and then you really need to get pulled out of bed, right? If you feel like, oh, I don't want to get up, I don't want to talk to this customer, then you should probably just get a job at another company and don't build your own company. Um, I'm not saying that this should happen every day like that. Um, because I also have sometimes days where I feel like, oh my God, this is shit, and I really don't want this now, and um, that's normal. But if it comes like very often, and if you feel like looking back the last month, you never wanted to get up, <laughs> uh, then you know, again, ask yourself if you're really doing the right thing. And I think sometimes it's also okay to just admit that, and then you know, do something else. Um, because in the end, you'd want to do this like your whole life, um, and it's I think a really bad starting point if you don't like it in the first weeks. So um, that's sort of something that another personal despite moment. Who of you has read the mom test? Oh, okay. Um, I think it was cooler like three years ago, <laughs> which doesn't mean that it's cool now still and useful. Um, it's from this guy, uh, Rob Fitzpatrick from London, and he just pretty much talks about, it goes into this like figuring out if you're gonna really solve a problem or not. And his point is, and I think from my experience it's very true, if you talk to your customers, they always wanna please you. You know, They always wanna say, oh yeah, sure, I have this problem. Sure, it's like the most important problem that I ever had, uh, I don't know, finding the files from my coworkers in Dropbox. Um, but usually it's not true. And, and, they, and they don't do this because they are stupid people or because they wanna, I don't know, just guide you in the wrong way. Uh, they just do that because they are nice people. And that's pretty much what this book is about because your mom is also very nice. Uh, <laughs> probably, but sometimes your mom is not the best person to get advice from because you know she just wants everything good for you, also short term. Um, so she would, you know, tell you that your product is amazing. Um, in my case, my parents I think don't even understand what we do, so they just <laughs> that's a different story. Uh, but usually, if they would understand, they would say, "Oh, that's amazing, Alex. It's great. You know, you're doing cool stuff." Um, but then if it doesn't work, it doesn't make sense, right? So this book is about how to structure interviews and talking with your customers in a way that you're not talking to your mom, but actually getting something out of it. And a lot of it is also about not asking too many guided questions and pretty much making sure that people actually tell you what their problem is, right? And even then, you never really know, but it's at least a little better than uh, getting in blindly in these user interviews. Um, so I think that that's something that helped us a lot in our understanding. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, happily answering them. Otherwise, as I said, we are hiring, mostly for engineers. Um, and otherwise, yeah, if I can give you guys any advice, just message me and hope you learn something out of this. <laughs> Thanks. I think there's also the saying um, that it's not the customer's job to know what his issue is so did you ever get to a point where you said um, uh, they my customers are great but they don't really know what their problem is and my solution is still great and I'm gonna force it upon them and <laughs> yeah um, yeah so I think there's this quote of um, I think Henry Ford or something who said that if I would have asked people what they want they would have said faster horses and then you know he would have never built the car um, so I don't know. I think it's it's this balance between having conviction for what you do, and I think what you do should always be like solving a problem and not building a product. I mean that's the solution to this, um, versus taking feedback into consideration. <laughs> so it's kind of it's hard. Uh, that's also why I wanted to give you like a few of these examples for like despite moments and sort of what it means if somebody really wants what you do. Um, we we had that in many ways. I think where we where we just thought okay if. Like you know, so we where we thought the problem itself exists of like finding stuff in your clouds and stuff like that, which I think still exists. But if it would only be easier for you 
to use it and you know to access it and you know making it even more seamless then it would be better and we would have more daily active users for example um which we found was really like a one way street in the end because um the it, and that's again right i mean if we would have had people like i don't know hundreds of people that use it every day still because even if it's like super hard to access then it's a very big problem for them and then it would make sense to build something like this um but i think for us it was always more an excuse to say let's make it simpler and let's make it more integrated and then it would work and it never really worked so it's it's kind of tough and i think um this this whole stuff around like envisioning something that is not there yet and nobody tells you i think that might be true for the solution part but it's definitely not true for the product uh, for the problem part unless you have something that's what i said earlier with um i don't know let's think about actually our our example is also a good one because um right now uh, you have like bot developers that are sort of you know our future customers that don't pay for us yet um so they might you know run into problems that other people don't have so listening to their feedback is really important for us to understand where the market goes uh, but we cannot monetize that right now so if we would only go for like large corporates they have different types of problems so it's kind of that's important to keep both in mind because if the market shifts towards something or like let's let's take bitcoin for example a uh, very contrary i think 5 years ago or 10 I, i don't even know when it came out but like you know 5 years ago i think it was still very contrary and now everyone is like oh my god i should have invested in bitcoin and then if you would have thought 5 years ago oh there is this bitcoin thing happening i'll build like an infrastructure company around it that allows me to have a wallet and all of that stuff Th i think that's more like the the example of henry ford <laughs> so i think seeing a larger market trend and then figuring out and anticipating what the problems of these customers could be that's a bet uh, but it could work but i think if you want to build something solving current problems that's not the right approach then so usually your customers are right <laughs> i think yeah sorry long answer to a short question uh, yeah yeah so i have two questions the uh, first one is why open source yeah oh, sorry yeah so i have a couple of questions the first one is why open source and the second one is the journey that you have with your co-founder because you guys were together before and even today so how how you divided the car? like i guess you're the business guy yeah yeah and he's the technical guy so how did it work like how did it merge together because obviously when you talk product it's you and him so yeah 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 i mean so why open source i mean overall uh, just quick recap so what we do is we give tools to developers so that they can build bots and assistants and two major tools for that the first one is around natural language understanding so pretty much passing text into structured data that you can use in a machine um the other one is around like managing dialogues and sort of the logic of the conversation um and the reason why it's open source is like manifold but uh, i think to boil it down is based on our own problem back in the days because when we started building this data bot thing um we wanted to make sure that the data set that we create around this because it's like all machine learning based so you have like training data that is labeled and sort of the system gets better over time the more high quality data sets you have we wanted to be in control of the data set so we didn't want it to send that to other people like facebook and google and microsoft and um, because that's a really high like proprietary asset that you can build up in your company and um, so that's why we built natural language understanding ourselves uh, pretty much gluing together a bunch of other open source tools and then when we came to the point where we realized that you know we want to build like an infrastructure company and other developers have these problems as well and um, we just thought back to okay what would have we taken back in the days would have been an open source tool because we did it ourselves we just build more functionality on top so there was a pretty clear um understanding for us and uh, we have a new product that is coming up uh, which is more like a framework to actually build bots and for that we see it more as like the html of conversation interfaces and for that open source is also important in terms of ubiquitous use um so that's the idea behind it plus if you then look into the enterprise market it's usually like that that for every like big trend if you take something like big data or like you know databases and things like that you had like mysql for example um in the search space you had elastic search there has always been like a large company that dominates this market and the reason is because if you're a large company you want to make sure that you're having no vendor lock in if you build something as important as like a database infrastructure right i mean you don't mind if you need to pay extra for like support and other stuff on top of that but you at least want to make sure that the core is open source um okay. plus in our field uh, there's a lot of research going on um it's still super early days with conversational ai and uh, we see that a lot of universities pick up open source pr projects like or like pretty much all open source project and build on top of that and contribute so that's also another 
angle. Um, how we split up work is exactly so. I'm uh, more like on the business side, Alan is more on the technical side, but we merge together in product and that's pretty much what we do. Um, we're definitely gonna have some like product people in the future as well, um, uh, which I think will be the hardest position to hire for. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so in terms of uh, product market fit, I'm interested to understand what's your process in order to, to, to move from one ID to another ID. Or do you validate or discard an ID? For example, say, oh, is a super is a super good ID. But what do you do to verify this and say, okay, I'd, no, let's not do it? Yeah. I mean, I think so. Again, first of all, uh, you should start with the problem um, that you want to solve, right? And then there are different solutions to this problem. And that's like what product market fit is about. So, um, so first of all, you want to validate the problem. And uh, if you've done that um, in like, I don't know, talking to people or out of your own experience and then talking to other people, then you can come up with solutions. And what we did back in the days was uh, we ran a lot of like experiments for like three to four weeks um, where we said like, look, this is not our company. It's an experiment. And with that in mind, it's much easier to kill an experiment than your company, right? Because if you t run around and tell everyone like, this is the thing I'm working on, um, it's just out of social pressure already really hard to say, oh, no, I'm working on something else the other day, right? But if you tell people, oh, I'm running le these free experiments, so I'm not saying I'm taking decisions based on other people, but I'm just like giving an example, um, it's much easier to kill then. Um, so that's what we did. And we had, I think, five different experiments back in the days. And they, they were all like these little bots. So we had like a data bot for gaming companies. We had one for restaurant owners uh, that we actually called Baxter for like, random reasons but yeah and did you had um did you think about the measure before launching the um, the experiment or or basically was based on instinct yeah we try to but it's i think really hard to come up with measures that's why i think it's better to come up uh, with like situations where you really feel that it solves a problem and there's product market fit um but yeah it's, it's hard to say right because if if you launch something on beta list and you get 200 signups what does it mean i mean it's cool but you know, maybe you just get two signups and they are the right ones and then you see that there's a market of like 200,000 of these people that just are not on beta list. So everything is like always very biased. So I think, yeah, just trying it out, I think is, is best, yeah. And iterating quickly on that. I'm mm -hmm.